Have you ever wondered what would it be like working for the goodwill of auto sales? Then this is the video for you. Obi, Juan Kenobi, please hold me, don't show me, Obi. Let's get serious, folks. CarMax. I'm actually going to start this video off a little different by saying three things, three things that I like about this company and three things that I dislike about this company right off the bat. Um, I want to try to avoid just being a straight up complaint rant video. Um, but, you know, keep in mind that I'm mostly addressing the negative. All right. This video is called Why I Quit. You know, this again, though, is just my opinion of a company based on my personal experience working at that company. Take it or leave it, um, but make your own decisions. So three things I like. Okay, CarMax has advancement opportunity. Um, they have the opportunity to make decent income uh, as a sales associate. And my favorite, you had the ability to buy backlot trade-in vehicles for cheap. Okay, uh, three things that I did not like at all. Low starting pay. It was like 12 bucks an hour for training. Uh, working nights and weekends, and which is unavoidable because it's, you know, car sales uh, and micromanagement. So those are the three bad. Um, so I, I made a video about working at Terminex not too long ago. And it got me thinking about some other jobs that, you know, I had that I ended up taking when my real estate business went belly up. And one of those jobs was at CarMax. So uh, this is Hands down, I think the largest used auto dealer in the country, maybe the biggest auto dealer, I, I think. Anyway, once I really started going broke in real estate, I was looking for a way to make some part-time money. Um, I saw an ad for CarMax, and it was actually working in the business office. Um, it was a part-time position. I applied for it. The uh, I had the initial interview over the phone, and... Obviously, must have done uh, well enough to get a second interview. Um, and the, actually, the manager he ended up calling and he says, "Hey, why don't you why don't you think about a sales position? You know, we like you. We think you'd be good in the sales role." Um, at this time, you know, I wasn't I wasn't really ready to give up on real estate yet. Just yet, um, I still wanted to do that full time. But you know, this was it was about that period of time that I began to realize that this, this whole real estate thing probably just wasn't working out for me. And it was probably a better idea to start working a job full time again. So I went for it. Um, this was a job, you know, it had advancement opportunities, plus it's a, it's a commission based job. So theoretically the sky's the limit, right? Um, it was my, my first reintroduction back into the corporate world. So, um, you know, it had been almost two years. Uh, I mean, it, it's been almost two years since I've quit my job at, at CarMax. So, um, but, but there is one thing that, that, uh, that I won't forget. And with this company, it's the scripts. Okay. Uh, people, people who are in sales, you know, that scripts are important. You know that you're, you need to know what you're going to say when you're talking to a customer and scripts will help you guide that conversation in the right direction. So the fact that they use scripts is not the issue. It's the way the managers enforce it. In fact, my biggest complaint, uh, the, the biggest complaint that I see online is, um, and this is something that I experienced myself, it, it has to do with micromanagement. You see that a lot when you're reading reviews. When I was there, the training focused on progressing you through different levels of the script. And you'll have to forgive me. Like I said, it's been a couple of years, uh, but the script was basically a, their version of who, what, where, when, why, you know, probing questions. Uh, for example, you're, you're part of the script. Uh, the first part of your script is your introduction where you're, you know, welcome to CarMax. Thank you for stopping in today. My name is Justin. I'll be your consultant. Shake hands. What can I help you with today? Uh, then, you know, you're supposed to, to ask about their situation. Well, tell me about your situation, which it's kind of funny because CarMax was adamant that you use that word situation. You were required to say it, not what brings you in. What are you looking for? It was, what is your situation? And a frequent answer that I got to the question was my situation. Um, where you could then explain, yeah, you know, what has you looking for a new car and stuff like that. Um, which I just, I thought it was funny because, uh, 
I felt it was important to get the customer situation, you know, um, why are you looking for a new car today? But you, you would actually get talked to. So somebody would talk to you if you did not use the word situation when you spoke to the customer. Um, so back to the training, when you, uh, when you have a weekly one-on-one with your assigned manager, you would go over the progression of the script. And I remember I was stuck in the introduction and, you know, in the situation portion of the training, because, um, on the sales floor, the management team would report that I wasn't using the word situation. I mean, no joke, the sales managers, you know, they spend a good chunk of their time just kind of hovering in the background, uh, listening to see if you're sticking to your script. Uh, here's the thing. I feel it's important to, important to point out here that most of my issues are due to personality conflict. Okay. I don't actually think it's a bad thing if they want to make sure their associates are following the very strict script guidelines. And, you know, I, I shouldn't have felt like I was a special case because of my sales experience, but that's what it came down to. So my first full month on the sales floor outside of training, which also happened to be my last full month that I worked there full time. Um, I was the second highest sales consultant in units sold. I did 18 units. The guy that beat me did 19. It was a very slow time of years, October, or November, something like that. So 18 units wasn't bad. Uh, don't quote me on this because I, it was about two years ago and I only worked there a little under three months. But when I was there, I believe you made about 160 per car. All right. You got an additional hundred dollars if you sold the warranty plan called Max Care. And there were additional kickers you could get, but you also had commission splits. So your pay fluctuated, but I, I made about 4,000 that month. And I've also, I've heard from, you know, some friends that uh, they reduced that, I think. So the new, the sales consultants there are now making less, but that's just gossip. I'm, I'm not going to pretend to, to know the price, the pay structure that they got going or there, if it's better or worse. Um, so anyway, my, my ego came into play a little bit, but I felt like I was doing something right. You know, I, I was number two, uh, that not that I need a pat on the back. I mean, it's nice and all, but I felt like the sales managers, uh, focus. I felt like their focus was just way off. I mean, I literally just outsold most of the other sales consultants there, but my manager didn't want to progress me through the training because I wasn't using the word situation enough. He didn't say, wow, Justin, 18 units your first month. That's impressive. Instead, it was more like, Justin, we got to get you on the right track. You're, you're skipping important steps in the script. Um, it's important that you ask the customer what their situation is. And so, you know, we would just keep role playing the script over and over. Uh, in fact, the, the other guy who beat me on units, uh, we'd bullshit together about how pointless the sales manager position seemed to be. Because uh, if I'm being honest, if you're good at sales, you can make some real money at CarMax. Uh, people were making good money at CarMax. Um I don't know what it's like there now, but you know, more than 60,000 a year, uh, more, you could make more as a sales consultant than you could like the set 60,000 a year that they were paying their sales managers. Uh, that's an educated guess. Uh, but of course you would have to work hard, come in on days off, push the, the warranty care or the warranty plan max care every time, you know, be on your A game. But we would joke that when our sales managers came around, uh, like I, like I said, they're hovering in the background somewhere waiting for the opportunity to manage you. Um, after a customer left your table, like they would come up and say something like, I noticed that you didn't ask the customer about their situation. You know, you, we would basically just nod and smile and say, Oh yeah, geez, you're, you're absolutely right about that. Sorry about that. I'll work on it next time. Won't let it happen again, sir. Um, so again, maybe I, I'm a little cocky, but I was very annoyed with the managers that were just on the patrol looking for reasons to manage when I felt like I was doing a good job. Um, I'm a manager now and I won't pretend that I'm the best at what I do, but I know better than to hover around my staff looking for reasons to correct their actions on a daily basis. Uh, especially if, 
if they are the or if they're one of the top performers, I'd be more apt to ask them what they did right. You know, not try to beat them into conformity because that's all I know. You know, it's the it's the age old mantra: those who can't do teach. I really feel that you know, I, I feel like that was the case at CarMax in Omaha, Nebraska. I should say, um, we had a bunch of sales managers that can't sell for shit, but they knew the script well. So with the exception of the general manager, I got to point this out. The general manager at the time, I mean, that guy was one of the best salespeople I've ever met. Uh, it's honestly unfortunate that there weren't more people like him there. Um, all right. So as I, as I begin to wrap this thing up, I think it's pretty clear that my biggest issue was micromanagement. I'm a pretty self-driven guy. I like to make money and I will figure out ways to do it without people breathing down my neck. You know, um, you mix that personality type with a business model that incorporates heavy supervision with a strict adherence to company script. And it's just not a good combination. You know, I was doomed from the beginning, but you know, there were, there were a few other noteworthy situations that contributed to me leaving. I'll move through them as quickly as I can. So one, no food or drink on the sales floor. So this rule was implemented during my time there and I'm a coffee drinker. I like having some coffee at my desk when I'm working, especially if it was non-customer present work, like calling to set up appointments or checking emails. You know, I understand why they did it. You would sometimes look out on the sales floor and you would see consultants, uh, one or two of them, maybe more, leaned all the way back in their chair, as far as that chair would go, eating vending machine pastries while crumbs are like rolling down the front of their shirts, watching YouTube videos on their phone. It looks unprofessional. But, you know, ban that shit. Talk to those people. Don't just ban all drinks because some people are clueless. Uh, two, the time clock. Uh, I'm 40 years old now. I was about 38 at the time. I haven't clocked, I haven't, you know, punched a time clock in 20 years. Having to do it wasn't a big deal for me, but the managers would act like it was a serious infraction. Okay. Forgetting to punch the clock, I forgot like five times over, you know, the two and a half months that I was there. And it would make them so angry. I mean, I was written up for it. When someone tells me, you know, when one of my guys, one of my people come up to me and say, I forgot to, I forgot to clock in. I jump on the time management system and fix it. It takes less than two minutes out of my day and I'm not pissy about it. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's because there are so many associates, whatever. I just felt like the managers, they took it way too personally and made it a, a way bigger deal than it really was. Um, three keeping people on the clock when it's slow. So this was a big deal. I started at a slow time of the year. We had many nights where there were like 10 sales consultants just standing around waiting for the clock to strike nine. Uh, this wouldn't be so bad if you were paid by the hour, but you're not, you're 100% commission. You know, I made a suggestion that they offer those sales consultants that already made a sale that day, the option to go home early if they want, you know, give some of the other consultants a chance to make a, you know, a sale, get a crack at it. But it's not something that they really cared to consider because they didn't have to worry about paying sales consultants wasted time on the clock. There's no such thing as a labor budget on a 100% commissioned employee. Uh, they do not care how many people are on the clock, even if there has been zero customer activity in over an hour. You know, you only get paid if you sell a car. They have nothing to lose by keeping you there. Um, four, being on point. So, uh, being on point is, is standing at the front desk, right? You're, you're greeting the guests. This, this was excruciating at times. Um, most of the time it was actually a good thing because when you're busy, you're standing on point, you're at the queue. Um, then you get some business, but you know, they, they had a, a queue where, you know, it was your turn to stand at the welcome desk, greet customers. Uh, we called it on point. Which, uh, like I said, it was cool sometimes uh, because CarMax, you know, it can be a buffet of customers who are just ready to walk in and then they are per they're purposefully funneled right to the desk where you're greeting them. But when it gets slow, this can be a real test of your patience. So keep in mind, no food or drink allowed, no cell phones 
And when you're at the front desk, you weren't allowed to sit. You were supposed to stand face front, wait for a customer to greet. Just take yourself off of the queue, you say? Yeah, I tried that. I mean, this was one of my last full time days there. It was one of the last final straws, I should say. Um, I was standing at the desk. Uh, I had been there for about 15 minutes already. I was standing uh, on point. I pulled my phone out because I'm a human being and I'm fucking bored. I started watching a video and Justin put the phone away. So I sigh. And then just remove myself from the queue. I, I sigh. I take myself off the queue. I start walking away from the desk. Justin, where are you going? I'm done with the queue. I said, I'm, I'm done with the front desk. You can let somebody else take it on. But the thing was, this manager had assigned me to the desk because nobody else wanted to put themselves on queue. Nobody wanted to be there, you know? Um, so standing at the front desk was pointless when there isn't regular, tra regular traffic in there into the store. Um, so he says, Nope, come on. We need somebody on point. It's your turn. I was like, Ken, I can't stand up here and stare forward for an hour. Like the damn British card. You can, you can send me home if you need to, but I am going to go sit at one of these desks and wait for the end of the day. I'm not standing here staring forward blanks. I was done. Okay. So by then, I had just I'd come to the conclusion that this company wanted robots, not humans, this location anyway. Shortly after that, I moved to part-time. And then I just left the company altogether to work at Granger, um, which Granger was a great experience, by the way. Uh, I loved it. Uh, in closing, you know, I, I want to make it clear that most of what I experienced was 100% my personality. I'd say 50-50. Um, I'm not the type that needs a bunch of supervision and I never got to serve, you know, I, I was never going to survive with this level of micromanagement. Uh, the, the big, yeah, here's the big question. All right. And now it's time for the big question. Would I recommend this place as a place to work? I mean, the truth is absolutely. Yeah. I mean, hear me out on this. If you're younger and you're looking for a place where you don't need, an advanced degree to make money, or you don't have sales experience, but you want to obtain some, this could be a great place to work. You know, they, they'll teach you a lot. Their corporate sales process isn't bad, but it's going to be tough. If you're a little stuck in your ways like me, you know, I just, I kind of wish that they would have left the people who were producing alone a little bit more and focused on those who weren't. Uh, but I also understand why they didn't want to make any exceptions to the rule. It's just, my personal opinion, but I don't feel like Carmel, or I don't feel like CarMax does well at retaining people who are self-motivated or entrepreneurial at heart, uh, because people like that do not do well being micromanaged. Uh, for instance, if, if, uh, I am figuring out what the customer situation is every time by having a conversation with them, then don't tell me I'm not doing my job correctly because I'm not literally using the word situation. It's a fucking pointless conversation. But like I said, whether or not you think they charge too much for their cars in the first place, this company is a great opportunity for the right people. Um, it's auto sales. So just, you know, don't get too fond of nights and weekends. Although, you know, if, if you were, I remember you were able to control your schedule a lot more if you made the president's club, which is kind of cool. Um, and if you, if you just flat out suck at sales, you just wait long enough, you could become a sales manager. Um, okay. So one last thing at the end of the day, CarMax, I mean, it did save me from the brink of self-destruction. I'll put it that way. I had just lost my house. My car was repossessed. My other car was falling apart. I may have not seen eye to eye with the managers or their style of management, but I was actually able to make some decent money for a couple of months. I was able to buy a couple of decent cars from the back lot for very cheap. Um, and keep in mind, you know, my, I was able to get my kids some health insurance, which was ridiculously overpriced and ridiculously expensive. If you're self-employed, you know, I was able to do all of this while I looked for something that was a better fit for me. Um, I've worked with too many people that just keep coming back to the same company day after day, year after year, and they just hate it. You know, yet they stay 
because they feel like they won't get the same pay or, you know, they won't get it somewhere else or they don't want to expand their skill set and do anything else. And they end up being miserable for it. Uh, maybe me complaining about, you know, or hating a job I have, even when I'm on the brink of homelessness is maybe it's a character flaw. Uh, but I'd rather take my chances and find something else rather than stay in a situation that will make me miserable. Then I'm okay with that. Uh, but that's just me. And, you know, that's, that's all I got on the subject. You know, again, I, it, all of this is just my personal experience and opinion. So do with the information what you will, but come to your own conclusions and uh, take care of yourselves out there. Seriously. Thank you. All right. Check out one of these videos next. And please, I'm begging you, subscribe to the channel. I really need for this channel to become successful so that I can just rub it right in the face of my two teenage boys. I love them. They love me. They're supportive. But nothing would make me happier than rubbing their arrogant little noses in the dirt on this one. I thank you.